Good afternoon. On November 16th, 2015, Mayor Betsy Hodges formally requested that my office, the FBI, and the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division commence a criminal civil rights investigation into the circumstances surrounding the shooting of Jamar Clark. The mayor made that request after discussions with concerned community leaders who requested an independent federal investigation into this matter. This morning, I wanted to, want to discuss our investigation, the approach we took to our review of this tragic incident, and how we came to the determination that there is insufficient evidence to pursue federal criminal civil rights charges. I also wanted to discuss our conversations with community leaders about the need for a focused and productive dialogue between law enforcement and the community. Short while ago, Mr. Thornton from the FBI and I met with the family of Jamar Clark. We expressed our condolences for the loss of their son, their brother, and we told them of our commitment to improve dialogue and progress to help us get to a place where a tragic incident like this never happens again. Shortly after the November 16th request by the mayor for a federal investigation, I assigned one of my most experienced prosecutors to work with the FBI in this matter. And the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department assigned two experienced prosecutors who specialize in police misconduct cases to work with us. Within days, these two experienced prosecutors from D.C. were in my office working with me and with the FBI to plan the investigation. Before I discuss more about the investigation, I also want you to know that today, this afternoon, Mr. Thornton and I will be meeting privately with community leaders who we've been talking to previously about this investigation about the results and about our desire for a focused, intense conversation about police reform and use of force in Minnesota. As you all know, at the same time that we were conducting our investigation, the State Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, the BCA, was working with the Hennepin County Attorney's Office investigating possible violations of state laws. The federal investigation was independent from the state investigation. While the state investigation focused on possible violations of laws pertaining to homicide or assault, our federal investigation focused on whether these officers and whether their conduct violated federal criminal civil rights laws. As detailed in the press release handed out this afternoon, we investigated whether the officers violated Title 18, United States Code, Section 242. Under Section 242, it is a crime for a law enforcement officer acting willfully to deprive an individual of their constitutional rights. Under this federal law, to prove that a shooting such as occurred here violated Mr. Clark's rights, the government would have had to establish beyond a reasonable doubt that the officer's use of force was objectively unreasonable based on the circumstances at the time. Also, to prove that the shooting violated Section 242, the government would have had to prove that the officers acted willfully, that is, that they acted with the specific intent to do something that the law forbids. And I want you to understand that this is one of the highest legal standards in the criminal law. Under this standard, it is not enough to show that the officers made a mistake, that they acted negligently or by accident, or even that they exercised bad judgment. To prove a crime under Section 242, we would have had to show that they specifically intended to commit a crime. It is with this law and these burdens in mind that we began our investigation. Throughout our investigation, we were guided by a set of rules that govern all federal prosecutors in all criminal cases. Under these rules, 
a federal prosecutor may only bring criminal charges when he or she believes that the admissible evidence establishes the defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Under these rules, it is our ethical obligation only to bring charges when we believe that we can meet this burden based on all of the evidence in our investigation. In other words, in a case where the evidence is unclear or highly contradictory or can lead to a number of different conclusions, it would be unethical for a federal prosecutor simply to indict and allow a jury to figure the case out. Before we bring a case, we must believe that we have a strong likelihood of proving our case at trial beyond a reasonable doubt. As I said, these rules apply to every single case considered by my office and by U.S. attorneys around the country. At the outset of this investigation, there were two very clear allegations for us to look into. One, that Mr. Clark was handcuffed by the officers, and two, that he was then shot, as people described, execution style, once he was on the ground with no struggle. Confronted with these very serious allegations and the communities and the mayor's request that we conduct a thorough independent investigation, we went to work. The attorneys and the FBI agents on this matter worked through nights, weekends, and holidays to locate witnesses, documents, forensic evidence, and other information that might help us determine what happened to Mr. Clark. And I want to make it very clear how important it was to this investigation that we had the partnership and experience of the Department of Justice civil rights lawyers from Washington, D.C. These two lawyers brought extensive experience investigating police misconduct around the country. The investigation team probed and questioned witnesses from the government, from the community, and elsewhere. We examined how evidence was collected and analyzed, and we took nothing for granted. Mr. Thornton, as the head of the FBI in Minneapolis, and myself, personally spent hours with the investigation team over the months of this investigation, searching for answers to the critical questions surrounding Mr. Clark's death. Our first focus was to determine whether Mr. Clark was handcuffed. The officers stated early on that they did not handcuff Mr. Clark but a number of witnesses stated that he was handcuffed. So we sought out to identify every person who viewed what happened, and we listened and considered the statement of every single witness. We did not take the officer's statements at face value. Rather, by talking to witnesses outside of law enforcement and others, we sought to determine whether there was sufficient evidence to disprove the officer's account. This point cannot be overstated. Despite the high burden of proof that I discussed above, we knew that if we could establish that Mr. Clark was handcuffed at the time he was shot, it would change the analysis of whether the officer's use of deadly force here was reasonable. It would be much simpler to conclude that the officer's use of force was unreasonable if we could show that Mr. Clark was restrained by handcuffs at the time he was shot. Because of the importance of the handcuff allegations, we spent a great deal of time evaluating the evidence that either supported or refuted the use of handcuffs. And again, I want to emphasize that we listened to and took into account the statements of all of the witnesses. Some we interviewed more than once. In fact, the different statements of community witnesses are an important factor in our decision today. As a prosecutor, you must take into account all of the potential evidence at trial in determining whether to bring charges, not just the evidence that supports one view or another. As a prosecutor, you know that the jury will hear the testimony, not only of the witnesses who support the prosecution theory of the case, but those who will refute it. So we had to comb through carefully and thoroughly all of the statements of all of the witnesses. 
A number of witnesses told us that they saw Jamar Clark in handcuffs. But that was not the end of the inquiry. We needed to know more about what they saw. And here, the witnesses' individual accounts were remarkably different. Some saw Mr. Clark with handcuffs on while he was standing. Some saw Mr. Clark with handcuffs in front of him. Others saw the handcuffs behind him. And others who were present when Mr. Clark was shot were very clear that he did not have handcuffs on at the time. Some said that he had handcuffs when he was standing up. Others said the handcuffs were only placed on him while he was on the ground. As I will discuss in a moment, some of these accounts were inconsistent with the available physical evidence. The fact that the witnesses who saw Mr. Clark handcuffed disagrees on the details in such important ways was important to our consideration of this matter. When any criminal case goes to trial, the prosecutor must put forth a coherent, consistent narrative of what happened. Here, in order to allege that Mr. Clark was handcuffed, we would have had to pick and choose between very different versions. Standing down or lying up, standing up or lying down, handcuffs in front or in back. However, as I said earlier, we knew that all of the evidence would be available to a jury, including sworn testimony that directly contradicted whatever theory we would have presented. If we chose one version over the others, all of the remaining versions would come into evidence, making it very difficult for a jury to believe beyond a reasonable doubt whichever version the government put forth. On top of this problem, there were also witnesses who were present at the shooting, who were very firm in their belief that Mr. Clark was not handcuffed. Their testimony at trial would have supported the statements of the officers who said that he was not handcuffed. In addition, the statements of ambulance workers and others that they saw Mr. Clark immediately after the shooting on the ground without handcuffs would have further undermined the conclusion that he was handcuffed. But our inquiry did not end there. Because of the disparity across witnesses regarding whether or how Mr. Clark was handcuffed, we looked carefully at forensic evidence so, and whether the forensic evidence supported or contradicted the officer's statements. Two pieces of evidence were very important to our conclusion. First, the only handcuffs recovered from the scene were tested for DNA and were determined to have insufficient DNA for any identification. These handcuffs were found on the ground next to Mr. Clark, who was not handcuffed when he was placed into an ambulance shortly after the shooting. The lack of DNA on the handcuffs was important to us because, at trial, the officer's lawyers would be able to argue that this showed that he was not handcuffed. Second, the medical examiner looking for, looked for bruising on Mr. Clark's wrists, which might have corroborated witnesses' accounts that he was in fact handcuffed. The medical examiner found no bruising. This evidence was, again, significant because, as the medical examiner stated, although this evidence is not conclusive, one would expect to see bruising under these circumstances. Because the lack of bruising was an important factor in our consideration, and an objective one, we decided to request an extra opinion from a federal medical examiner outside of the state of Minnesota. The person we chose is highly respected nationally and is relied on for sensitive matters within the federal government. Getting this extra opinion took some time and added to the length of our investigation, but we felt it was important. If we were going to place weight on the lack of bruising, as we did, we wanted to be very sure of the medical opinion. The federal medical examiner from outside of Minnesota reviewed the evidence and concurred with the opinion of the Hennepin County Medical Examiner. And I want to be clear, we sought an outside opinion not because we doubted our local medical examiner. Rather, back in November of 2015, 
We made a commitment to the family and to the community that we would be thorough and independent. And during our investigation, we took extra steps in order to make certain that we were fulfilling that commitment. Given the lack of bruising, the lack of Mr. Clark's DNA on the handcuffs, and the deeply conflicted testimony about whether he was handcuffed, we determined that we could not pursue this case based on a prosecution theory that Mr. Clark was handcuffed at the time that he was shot. And in fact, we reached the conclusion based on all of the evidence that we reviewed that the evidence suggested that Mr. Clark was not in fact handcuffed when he was shot. Our second area of focus was what happened when Mr. Clark and the two officers were on the ground. We wanted to know whether the available evidence would support a finding beyond a reasonable doubt that the officers acted in a manner that was objectively unreasonable, even if Mr. Clark was not handcuffed. The officer stated that Mr. Clark grabbed Officer Riggenberg's gun while they were struggling on the ground, and that this caused Riggenberg to call out to Officer Schwarzy to shoot. Both officers stated that they feared for their lives. In order to bring charges in this case, under the rules that I explained earlier, we would have to believe that we had sufficient evidence to disprove these statements and prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the officer's conduct was willful and objectively unreasonable. Once again, however, the statements of the witnesses to the event were highly contradictory. Some saw a struggle, others did not. And there were great discrepancies between the witnesses as to where the officers were and where Mr. Clark was once Mr. Clark was taken to the ground. Given these contradictory statements, we again turn to forensic evidence to assist us in reaching a conclusion. And the first is the ambulance video that captured a portion of the incident. As you can see on the video, Officer Riggenberg appears to be struggling to get away from Mr. Clark. And on two occasions, he reaches back to his belt. And Mr. Officer Riggenberg gave this statement before the release of the videotape, so he didn't know what the videotape would show. If the case were to proceed to trial, the officer's lawyers would point to this portion of the video and argue that it corroborates both officers' statements that Mr. Clark was grabbing the gun. While the video is not conclusive on this point, it does make it extremely difficult for a prosecutor to disprove the officer's statements beyond a reasonable doubt. Second, Officer Riggenberg's gun tested positive for Mr. Clark's DNA. Once again, this evidence, like no, no one piece of evidence, can be called conclusive, in part because the tests cannot determine how the DNA got on the gun. However, that's not the test for us. The presence of Mr. Clark's DNA on the gun would make for a powerful argument in favor of the defense if the case were to go to trial. And that is what we have to take into account in determining whether to bring charges. I will not go through each and every investigative step we took in order to reach our conclusion. But we were thorough and detailed. For example, we evaluated the phone records of the officers to determine who they called after the event and interviewed witnesses who were contacted by the officers after the event. And we tried through the FBI lab to find any video that might have existed from the Elks Lodge camera. As has been stated by others so eloquently, there are no winners here and there's no victory for anyone. A young man has died and it is a tragedy. As a father with children the same age as Jamar Clark, my heart goes out to his family and I told them so before this event. For the family, for the community, for the police department, and for the cause of justice, experienced, highly trained agents and prosecutors worked for months to find and examine facts to determine if there is a criminal civil rights case that can be brought here. We have all concluded that no such case can be made. But that should not end our inquiry. 
Jamar Clark's tragic death has raised serious questions that must be addressed. We believe that law enforcement and the community in Minnesota must enter into a serious dialogue on the use of force in Minnesota. That is why Mr. Thornton and I, in discussions with community leaders, have been working with police and sheriffs around Minnesota to create a pilot program to engage community leaders and others in a discussion on police use of force and police reform. Mr. Thornton will discuss that initiative in a moment. After a detailed, thorough, and independent investigation, the FBI, the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division, and the U.S. Attorney's Office have concluded that we are unable to bring federal criminal civil rights charges in this matter. But all of us involved over the past number of months want to work to address the deep concerns that have become evident so that we can have a healthy and productive dialogue that can prevent such tragedies in the future. Support. Good morning. As Mr. Luger just mentioned, my name is Rick Thornton. I'm the special agent in charge of the FBI for Minnesota, North Dakota, and South Dakota. I'm going to touch on a couple of points that Mr. Luger made earlier just to, uh, uh, just to reinforce those. But in our meeting with Jamar Clark's family earlier this morning, we discussed in substantial detail the investigative steps we took, the evidence, the federal civil rights laws involved, and the conclusions Mr. Luger just announced. The investigation of this matter involved numerous highly experienced FBI special agents and senior prosecutors. All told, the FBI and the United States Attorney's Office expended hundreds upon hundreds of hours in this investigation, conducting interviews of witnesses, review of video and forensic evidence, uh, gathering and retrieving phone records, documentary evidence, reviewing police policies and training manuals, conducting DNA examinations, and numerous other investigative steps. This investigation began with no preconceived notion of where it might lead. As Mr. Luger explained in his remarks, there were a number of significant challenges with this investigation, principally attempting to reconcile the highly variable witness accounts on the issue of whether Jamar Clark was handcuffed, as well as what happened while Jamar Clark and the officers were on the ground. This investigation was also extraordinarily difficult and emotional for Jamar Clark's family and friends, and for many of the witnesses to the incident. I would like to commend and thank all of the witnesses who made themselves available to be interviewed, many who did so in spite of their great reluctance to speak with law enforcement. Although this completes our inquiry into any federal criminal violations associated with Jamar Clark's death, it does not end our commitment to the very real and serious issues this tragedy highlighted. Our pledge to everyone here in Minnesota is we intend to use this tragic event to drive a conversation which must take place, a conversation where we talk <coughs> excuse me, about how police and the community interact, about whether and when the use of force by police is and is not both legal and appropriate, and about what the police must do and about what the community must do to ensure the safety and security of our community and for the officers who put their lives on the line to serve. These are not easy issues, and there are no simple answers. The United States Attorney and the FBI has already started this conversation with respected members of law enforcement community here in Minnesota, as well as with a diverse group of community leaders. We are meeting with community and religious leaders later today and again tomorrow. Our goal is to facilitate a conversation regarding the very real concerns expressed by the community, as well as the concerns and challenges that face law enforcement officers every day. This has been and will continue to be a topic of significant interest on the national stage, both within the government, community groups, and law enforcement associations. The national discussion is one good thing to come out of this awful tragedy, and many smart people will be searching for solutions and seeking ways to deliver the best policing possible for the people of Minnesota and to improve 
relationships between police and the communities we serve. We are not going to wait for someone else to figure out the way forward for us on this issue. We intend to develop a Minnesota solution, and as I said previously, this process is already underway. Thank you very much.